Also, we, uh, Cole engaged the volunteers as co-creators in his work. So there was a heavy community investment in this project right from the beginning. And so we thought, okay, how can we um, make a work that can be accessible? And how can we make a work that could um, allow for other voices to be a part of it as well? So we also produced a video for the work. And I wanna thank Jamie McMillan for creating this incredible video that documents the process from before the harvesting all the way to when the structure was built. And then we thought, okay, how can we have more critical engagement with all the complexities and the ideas that are being brought forth through this work? And so we applied for the Canada Council of, for the Arts for a grant to produce a catalog and we're able to have two very thoughtful and insightful essays by Helen Gregory and Darren Duell. And so we're very grateful for the Canada Council for that grant. And we're also very grateful to the writers and their very thoughtful contributions to be able to produce the catalog that we're launching today, but also serve as a space for um, really scholarly in, um, at voices that added to the interpretation of this work, but also a permanent record of this project. Um, if you haven't seen the catalog, it's absolutely stunning. And we have to thank Anya Belton, who's one of the most talented graphic designers I know and is the marketing coordinator at the VAC for spending countless hours in producing this amazing catalog. Um, this catalog lives in hard copy, but it also lives virtually. And the virtual copy includes videos by Jamie's videos included in that um, online version. And finally, I have to thank Cole because you have created such um, an incredible, thoughtful work. You've invested so much time in researching and being um, really uh, investing in getting to know community partners and involving the community in this project and bringing a really complex and nuanced narrative to the space. And the more we talk about it, the more things I learn. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation and I wanna thank you for that. So thank you, Cole, and it's over to you. <laughs> thank you, Sandy. Every time you speak about the work, it just makes my heart swell because uh, when I think about this piece and I think about the exhibition, um, which has taken place over the course of, um, I would say well over a year now, um, we've formed so many important relationships and strengthened relationships like the one that I have with you. And it's been an amazing experience to work with you again. Um, as you mentioned, we started in a small way, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and here we are working together in such a complex and, and exciting way. So it's been a real pleasure. And I, and I do want to take a, a moment to thank everybody at the Visual Arts Center of Clarington for their incredibly, incredibly hard work and support. Um, it's a, it's a small organization full of incredibly passionate, intel, intelligent, and creative people. So thank you to everybody, the whole team, every volunteer that was involved in the harvest. Um, uh, we have family members, friends, you know, it's a, the, the level of investment um, from the community has been really humbling. Um, when Sandy and I first started talking about the commission, I, I, you know, sometimes people ask like, how, how did you come up with this idea to build like a giant thatched pyramid? Um, and really the starting point for this project was uh, the question of um, what relationships do we have with nature that are kind of tense or problematic? And that's a question I ask myself all the time in my work. Um, so if you become familiar with some of my other projects, you'll know that I'm attracted to the things humans generally not attracted to. So I like things like, you know, creepy crawly insects and cormorants, birds that, you know, um, are in the news every, every three days or so. Um, and also lichens and bacteria. I love the stuff that makes us uncomfortable because it's a really interesting creative starting point for me to say, try to deconstruct the many layers of that relationship. And so for me, art is an opportunity to investigate some of those stories, um, represent things in a multifaceted or a multi-layered way and have the, the very narrow narrative that tends to dominate you know, the public discourse opened up or ex expanded upon or even challenged. Um, so when we were talking about Durham region, I, you know, it sounds a little unglamorous, but frankly, like I just did a Google search at what was the species that was really getting under the skin of the, the community here. And the very first thing that came up was this grass, you know, Phragmites, 
um, specifically Phragmites australis, subspecies australis, which is a kind of Eurasian um, perennial grass that we know as European common reed. Um, you've seen it for sure, even if you're not aware that you've seen it. Um, and that's one of the sort of interesting things about a plant like this is that um, its fluffy seed heads blowing in the wind, you know, on the highway sides are so ubiquitous, they're, they're everywhere, that they're almost imperceptible, like they're almost invisible. Um, and so, you know, starting on this project taught me an enormous amount really early on about how pervasive um, this invasive species was and the very real impacts it's having to biodiversity. In the Durham region, because the Great Lakes regions are quite affected and have been for some time, but also throughout other areas of Canada now. So this is a species that is spreading. It's even spreading westward. I read an article the other day that called it uh, the crabgrass on steroids, which is really interesting. Um, and uh, thinking about you know invasiveness and the 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 conversation that we have about it, which is this that uh, you know this is an invasive species, so therefore it's bad and we have to get rid of it. I thought there's got to be more to it than that. You know, it's it's almost like the default response to something being problematic is that it is like a disease, it's a virus, it needs to be eradicated. But people aren't really talking about why it's here, you know, what it teaches us about ourselves and the way that we navigate the world, or you know, what kinds of relationships have existed not just now in the contemporary moment, um, but have existed maybe with this organism over the centuries. Um, so, you know, embedded in this project were lots of different ideas um, that started, I think, with a foundation of asking ourselves, like, how does one organism, which is native in one place, make its way over to another place to become invasive? And the parallels are striking. I'm, I'm sure we can tease this out in the conversation. And the essays do a really brilliant job of, of um, imagining some of the stories and, and thinking about the, the critical themes at the heart of it. Um, but, you know, this is, a, this is an organism that moved from, you know, Europe um, across oceans and has since populated so much of our landscape in the way that parallels colonialism um, and even before that, just empire in general. So if we think about, you know, the expansion of power from one place to another and how nature is thought of as a resource um, and the fallout of that process, which you know doesn't happen overnight, it happens in this case over the, over the course of centuries, um, really provides a much more robust and interesting entry into thinking about this organism. So in this show, I've, ta I've talked about mythology, you know, the stories of King Midas and how um, Midas, you know, who is sort of a, an allegory of a greedy, ignorant, you know, king. Um, I, I say a symbol for imperial ambition is somebody who, um, you know, we're all familiar with Midas touch. He touched everything that he wanted, everything he touched to be gold. And then he realized that even the food and water he was touching were turning to gold and would threaten to kill him. Um, so he renounced that, went into the forest and lived with Pan, the cloven hoofed, you know, nature um, us, uh, deity, and uh, played judge to a musical contest between Pan and Apollo. And this is a story that not very many people know, but I discovered through my research on this, this plant. Um, and so Pan, you know, the rustic Pan pipe flute playing guy, um, went up against Apollo, the royal sun god, this sort of imperial god who plays the lyre. And everybody agrees that Apollo's music is better just after one stroke of a string, but Midas sides with Pan, you know, the, the subordinate deity that represents nature. So there's this really interesting binary position between you know imperialism like royalty the royal god of apollo and nature the sort of lesser thing that follows western thought um, so as punishment for choosing to side with pan apollo turns king midas's ears into the ears of an ass so he's walking around with donkey ears and that's apparently super embarrassing um, so he wears an array of fancy hats and he, and he grows his hair long and one day his barber discovers it. And so Midas swears into secrecy, you know, don't tell anybody about my ass ears. And um, the, the barber just can't hold it in. So he, he bores a hole into the ground with his finger and he whispers the secret into the ground. Midas has the ears of an ass. And from that hole grow a thicket of reeds, a stand of reeds, which, um, you know, at their full height, start to whisper or hiss in the wind. And the name of this piece is, is 
based, it's taken from this story, The Hissing Folly, because the sound of the hiss gives away Midas' secret. It tells the whole world that Midas has these ass ears. And to me, this story like links the idea of this, this, these reeds, these plants, with human folly and imperial ambition and greed. And, and so that seemed to be a really interesting parallel, right? Like this ancient sort of um, mythological tale that really beautifully runs in step with this longer imperial and colonial history, which is about expansion and the spread of you know, people and economy into a new land, which is actually an old land that was inhabited by indigenous people who didn't share the same, same value system. And here we are today. So it's, I mean, that's a very simplified teleological history, but I think that there's a lot to be said about thinking about the much broader cultural and natural history that sort of intersects and plays with storytelling, mythology, history, capitalism, everything is embedded in this form. And then before I, I, I go on forever and ever, I do want to point out that the form itself, the folly, isn't just a nod to the word foolishness. It's actually a term that is borrowed from the practice of building architectural, um, sort of functionless architectural ornaments in England, um, most popularly. Um, so in the 17 and 1800s, uh, these landowners would have massive, you know, palatial mansions and outside of their, their um, estates, they would have in the gardens, these small versions of monumental forms, architectural forms. So like ruined Gothic abbeys and, um, and pyramids are actually particularly uh, popular. So I love the idea of the folly, this sort of functionless, absurd architectural form making its way to North America as well with, with the British. Um, and that, that has happened here in Canada. We do have follies here and there. You've probably run into some of them and didn't really know that that's what they were. Um, and so I endeavored to create a folly a pyramidal folly um, that would inhabit the space, and you can see it behind me, I'm actually in the space now, um, that grows up into the rafters of this former barley mill, right? It's like, you know, barley is this thing that we've commoditized, it's an, it's an organism, it's something that has, you know, like most farm, uh, farm plants have taken over huge tracts of land and put pressure on ecosystems. And now we're looking at this invasive species, which is like organized together through the ancient art of thatching um, that almost bursts through the rafters of this building. Um, so there's a lot of layers to the work, a lot of different lenses that we can look at it through. Um, but today, you know, I, I was so thankful to have the opportunity to talk with you all about the project. Um, we've, we've definitely had some challenges with COVID. Um, we've worked really hard to create an immersive sound installation where you walk inside and you hear the hissing of the reeds speaking to you. And, and so few people have had the opportunity to become intimate with that work. So um, the, the catalog, as Sandy rightly points out, is a really nice entry into the piece as well. Um, the digital catalog has beautiful little video clips and the essays that Darren and Helen have written are really um, beautiful meditations on, on some of the core themes that are present in the work. So that's a little bit about the context. Um, and um, I'm happy to be here with everybody to answer questions or have, you know, a nice conversation about the catalog itself. And I'll hand that back to you, Mark. Oh, there we go. I unmuted myself. Sorry, guys. I'm not too good with this. Go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you so much for bringing it back to the catalog. I actually have it here with me and it is so beautiful. Um, it's incredibly rare for um, regional galleries to be producing, uh, you know, catalogs like these. Um, and I also wanted to take a moment to like introduce um, Darren and Helen who are here. Darren Duell is a curator of Canadian Art at the Rooms in St. John's and Helen Gregory is the curator of the Macintosh uh, Gallery at Western University in London, Ontario. And as Sandy mentioned, the other writing, you know, really informed, um, you know, really provided these really beautiful entry points, this like almost polyphonic voice into all that this exhibition is, everything that it encompasses, um, both historically, you know, looking back quite to ancient times, to, con to contemporary times as well. Um, so 
uh, I'm going to be reading out some excerpts that um, Sandy and Cole had chosen. Um, and if at any moment these excerpts, you know, recall um, ideas or provoke questions, we'd love to hear from you. And at the end of these passages, we'll be unmuting the audience so that you can join in the conversation or alternatively, um, as my director Dion mentioned in the chat, you can post the questions um, in the chat uh, below or you can send them to me privately if you don't want to put them in publicly, that's totally fine too. Uh, so I'm just going to begin with the first excerpt, and this is from Darren's essay, uh, Bucolic Infestation, The Hissing Folly. So in his writing, Darren states, Swanson's uh, pyramidal folly is a phenomenology of, wet of the wetlands. It tells stories with multi-sensorial appeal. In this space, colonial trade routes and the seeds of empire are deeply rooted. Such foundations are made visible through the materiality and temporal fluidity that envelops the present, the recent past, and ancient myth in equal measure. In concert with ecological awareness and community activation, these relations form the ground from which the pyramid rises. Um, so just reflecting on, on uh, Darren's passage, I felt that he unraveled the overlapping historical narratives that inform your work, Cole, and also the processes, you know, the associations that it brings up when we think of invasive species as parallel histories with empire and European colonization, as you mentioned in the beginning of the talk. Uh, but I just want to expand the conversation a little bit further. Like, what are, what are your thoughts on this, Cole? Yeah, I think... Um... I, I spoke a little bit about the, the interweaving of those stories. So whether they're mythological stories or their their history, um, as we've come to know it or or not know it, because history is so you know biased and transforming all the time. Um, and Darren rightly points out that like the form itself, the material itself, all of those stories are embedded in this work, right? So the material has a, a history of of exchange with humanity. Um, the I, I would just sort of turn it back to the idea of these reeds, like in their in their Eurasian habitat, they're much smaller. They have um, competition in their environment. Um, humans have used them in the in the history of thatching, and so one of the reasons why I've turned to thatching as a as a studio sort of methodology is because that's how the plant had been used for some time. It wasn't the most popular plant to use in thatching, actually, in Europe. Um, it, there, it didn't grow to the extent that it would be useful for them as a commodity. But here we are in, the, in Canada, in the Great Lakes region, and there's more of it than we would ever wish to have. Um, so there's a really interesting kind of process of inversion that happens as, that, as those stories kind of take place in parallel. So I think Darren has done a good job of thinking about, you know, imagining stories, you know, what those stories are. And his essay opens up really beautifully with a, a parafiction about um, one of the theories about how Phragmites came here in the first place. And the belief was that, or at least the, this theory, is that elephants that were being brought originally from India over to Europe, um, and then on boats to North America for circuses needed some kind of robust bedding. Um, so Phragmites being thicker, denser stalks would provide nice bedding for these elephants. And so his essay opens up with this really beautiful um, sort of retelling of the, the, uh, of the, the, the myth that this plant made its way over on these ships and provided some comfort to um, Old Bet, who's one of the more uh, famous elephants that made it, uh, their way over to North America, I think into New York City, if I recall. Um, from from Europe. So, you know, parafictions, I think, like musing on, or speculating on the ways in which these organisms, um, in, like the stories in which bind us to these organisms, is a really creative way to open up an alternative way of thinking about this. Like I said, to go back to my original point, you know, Whenever it comes to a, like a problematic species, we tend to only talk about them in one way. We talk about them as being bad, and we talk about them in the present context, like what they're doing wrong now. But when we start to entertain the idea um, and be creative and imaginative about the different connections and relationships that, that are shared between our species and theirs, um, we start to see that like we have agency in this as much as the organism has agency in this spread, right? In, in fact, 
it's very easy for us to ignore the fact that the reason why these organisms are here is very likely anthropog anthropogenic. So they've come here very likely because of human activity. And we certainly know that their spread is in large part because of the way that we've developed the land in a post-colonial, in, in a like in a colonial and, and now in a post-colonial context. So Phragmite is just, I, I do think it's important to sort of acknowledge the, the kind of amazing um, evolutionary thing that Phragmites are, right? Because they're like a grass that has met almost every human challenge as if it's some kind of opportunity, not consciously like a human would, but they're so robust, they're so adaptive. They have these incredible ways of reproducing themselves. I mean, there's a lot to respect about this organism. And my thought has always been that like the reason why we're really uncomfortable with certain things in the natural world is because they represent a challenge to our domination of the natural world. And right now, Phragmites are pressing up against our sense of control over, our, over the land. And I think that's a really interesting thing to kind of to, to sit with for a bit. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's so much I could talk about in regard to Darren's Darren's piece and also your question, but I think I think that might be a good a good place to stop right now. <laughs> um, I think also cool to add to what you were saying. To me, um, Darren's passage also kind of hints at the idea of narrative in land, so that there there are stories that come out of this, and there's there's a story that comes out of your extraction of the Phragmite from the space. And I think that's really interesting because oftentimes it's the opposite, is that we extract things in order to assert our own narratives on land. We extract to make things more comfortable for us so that we can build even the idea of a folly to exist just for decorative purposes in a landscape as if the landscape in and of itself is not enough. So for us to look at this from a different standpoint and say that this actually this wetland has so many narratives that we can pull out and recognize how the history our history and what we've done to land has impacted it and now we can't control it brings in a really interesting kind of paradox to the project oh, there you go. okay there you go <laughs> no you're off again <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> okay, there we go. I think I'm allowed to talk now. Awesome. <laughs> Sandy, that was so beautifully uh, stated what you just mentioned. And it actually, it brings us to the second um, excerpt that you both had selected, um, which comes from Helen's Phragmites and the Folly of Human Endeavor. And I'm going to read it out and then we're going to reflect on it. Um, so uh, in her essay, she mentions uh, highlighting the complexity of this ecological conundrum. The hissing folly is an exercise in the paradoxical, inspired by the pyramidal form common to many years European follies, its rigidly geometric structure bellies the ephemeral, organic stuff of its construction. It's a building within a building. It's both interior and exterior, an inside constructed from an outside, nature reconfigured as culture. Musing on the loft gallery's history as a barley mill, Swanson imagined the process by which the grain might have entered the mill for processing. In homage to the speculative past, he brought bundles of Phragmites into the loft to dry before using them to construct the hissing folly in C2. So in just like reflecting on, on, this, on this beautiful passage, I was sort of reminded that follies are often, as uh, Cole mentioned and you mentioned, Sally, um, um, you know, uh, uh, often monumental and extravagant structures with no real uh, function. Uh, the phrases exercise in the paradoxical and ecological conundrum feel particularly appropriate. Uh, the hissing folly is in many ways an anti-monumental structure. It reveals, you know, uneasy tensions between um, capitalism, labor, and the complex relationship that, you know, we as humans have with the earth. Um, so Sandy, what are, what are your thoughts uh, on this, if you want to expand it a bit further? <laughs> I, I think Helen's passage so beautifully um, communicates all the paradoxes and complexities of the narrative in which Cole's work uh, kind of lays out. And there's so many paradoxes that we can kind of list out. So uh, number one is that the work reveals an ecological conundrum as a figure of folly. And the, the, pro the reason for this conundrum is because of our own folly, most likely. 
Uh, number two is that term folly. So number one, the word folly <laughs> is, means foolishness, but also it's an architectural term in which we erect these completely useless decorative buildings uh, and structures, and it's associated with extravagance. And that's, again, our own kind of consumption and our own kind of selfishness and how we assert ourselves in space and in land. And then to think about, just to think about the process in which how Cole kind of constructed the folly. So number one, he built a building within a building as Helen states. So there's again, that idea of the folly, there's, there's no real purpose for the structure that exists in the loft gallery. And on top of that, he thatched everything upside down. So if it were to rain on this structure, it would retain all of the water instead of letting it flow down. So he he purposely added to the foolishness and the folliness of that folly structure. And then to bring in that element of the mythical, that King Midas's folly led to his donkey ears, which led to his barber discovering it, which in which he whispered into the ground. And now these follies hiss his um, kind of secret out forever. <laughs> And so there's so many layers of contradictions and paradoxes in the process, in the narrative, in the in just in the construction of the work. And I think Helen really beautifully articulates that. I completely uh, agree with you. It was uh, so well on. Sorry, go ahead, Cole. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say, I like how Helen poses questions in, in her essay. Like she's sort of saying, you know, rather than drawing conclusions about what the work is or the context around which the work is, has been framed, um, there is a question like, is this about the, I think, like Sisyphus, you know, pushing the boulder up, up, the, up the hill forever is, is a, a metaphor that's brought into her essay. Um, and, you know, one of the things about Phragmites and where we're at right now with it is we don't really understand how to um, deal with the issue that has been created. So um, one of the things that I, I, I do want to mention is that, you know, early part of re part of the research was getting in touch with lots of different people who are, were, were experts um, in the field of invasive species. And so I did work with Diana Sherman um, from Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority to learn what the conservation authorities, you know, are doing about the situation, how they assess the level of threat, um, what techniques are used to try to control the Phragmites. And so to Sandy's earlier point, you know, we clear cut about one and a half acres of this stuff, but we didn't solve the problem. And that's something that I think Helen nods to is that like no amount of doing exactly what we did is going to solve the problem because it's such an enormous and complicated process to try to pull back this organism once it once it takes root. Um, and part of that is the amazing capability of this plant to grow really deep roots, to, um, to uh, release toxins into the ground, to withstand high and low water temp water levels. Like they're, they're just designed in, in, and have evolved in such a way that um, to imagine getting rid of all of them, is, it's like an, it's an impossible feat. So sometimes when, when we acknowledge that, people say like, okay, well then what's the point? Like, why do this? And I think to bring it back to the work and the process, this was about, for me personally, it's about understanding some, some important aspect of nature in the world around me and, and, and especially in light of my broader practice, but it's also about trying to open up um, a conversation about this, this challenge ecologically that we're facing and um, to get the community involved and to get people to start recognizing what's happening because so much of it is invisible. It's, um, it's almost like a passive, I hate to say that because I, I do believe in our acknowledging our agency in ecological issues, but nobody set out to spread this thing. It's sort of a, pa a byproduct, we're like a passive system where this is happening alongside all of the kinds of development that we've been engaging in on like in a massive way. And so as long as we continue to engage in the development that we are, we will continue to see this organism flourish. And therefore we will continue to see biodiversity reduced in our country. Um, and I think that it, like posing that question very publicly and getting community involved in using artwork as a way of increasing visibility and education is is really what the heart of the project is. It's not about just clearing an acre and a half. 
because there are God knows how many acres of Phragmites out there. And in fact, when you drive to the art center here, you get off the highway and there's Phragmites on the, like, on the way in to see the gallery. So it's just, it's about recognizing it and starting a conversation. And then hopefully, you know, in time, putting pressure on government systems to um, bolster funding, to support conservation authorities. And, um, and one of the most interesting research uh, projects that came out in my research was connecting with um, uh, connecting with researchers who are looking at alternative methods of control. Um, and so I was working with um, one of my Humber co-faculty um, who is a specialist on um, Phragmites management. And we were talking about um, whether or not there is a non-toxic um, alternative because often you cut, you clear cut them down and you apply herbicides, which is really damaging to not just the Phragmites, but also the entire ecosystem. And so um, we, we started talking about indigenous, um, indigenous control techniques. Um, so um, we were looking at what, she, well, her research was looking at whether or not um, there was a possibility of not using herbicides and to embrace an indigenous um, technique of reducing um, the, the Phragmites spread without uh, using any harmful chemicals and then introducing native species to replace it. So it's kind of like idea of taking that which is invasive out. Um, and so one of the techniques not to get into the minutia of it is to cut the roots off underneath the water level so that they actually drown. So it's like thinking about, you know, really getting to know the anatomy of, um, this, of this organism better to a, it, to a point where you can actually start to not only control it and to be able to predict how it would react in different environments, but also to encourage the native species to, to, um, to take that space. So it's sort of like a multi-pronged approach. And that comes out of an indigenous knowledge system that has been applied for thousands of years in our country. And so there was a very obvious choice early on when we were doing this work to not um, go the route of applying herbicides because of the research um, that came out of that relationship. I know I just kind of went on a really long rant about it. There's a lot, to, there's a lot in here. There's a lot to talk about. There is. There's a lot back in there. Yes. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of uh, questions that we got from the audience and I, and I want to acknowledge them because they're very interesting. So the first one that we have is, uh, did you learn the art of thatching in England? Uh, no. <laughs> so <laughs> I can say that out, right? Um, when, I, when I discovered that Phragmites was used for thatching, I, I didn't know that we could actually pull this project off. And Sandy and I have joked through the whole process that there was a lot of variables in this work and there were a lot of points where things could have gone off the rails. Um, but one of the reasons why I decided to proceed with the proposal was that my brother-in-law, Harry Knight, is um, his, his father um, was a thatcher in England. And so he was, a, he was a builder in England and thatching was just a, a part of the work that he did because when you worked in the area that he worked in, you, restoring thatched roofs in England is actually a pretty commonplace task. Um, so part of the early research was actually connecting with him and getting to know the process and um, watching a ton of like tutorials and reading and practicing. And, um, and there are some major differences with how this has been that thatched. So one of the things that Sandy pointed out is I deliberately thatched it upside down so that if it did rain, water would catch in the reed and actually deliver it inside to the person who's seeking shelter. So there's like this kind of absurd thing happening. Um, but also the reed in its invasive form is much thicker, thicker and more robust than you would see in England. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's more difficult in a way to control. And so we've had to modify the technique a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but, but, the fact that um, Harry, his son, um, and myself were the two that thatched it, and Harry's a builder, so he knows what he's doing. We, um, the fact that it looks as good as it does is still a shock to me mm. because you know you're you're layering on these bundles, these yelms we call them, and you can see them in the sort of background here. The, in, in the background there are these um, uh, bundles that are tied together, and then you lay them down, and you have to strap them to a frame. And then you hit them in place with a tool that we just kind of improvised. Mm. Um, so it was really about shaping that pyramid and making sure that the, the distribution of that material was even across the whole form. And that was the biggest challenge. And that was the, that was the job I had. So um, it's, I'm a very uh, meticulous worker uh, 
in my studio practice, I've got lots of, like I'm a little anal retentive, I suppose, and that lends itself really well to the to the process. So I know how to do it now, which is amazing. This is a great learning experience. Um, my other question, actually it's not my question, it's a question from an audience member. Um, so they're asking, how much of a threat are Phragmites toward dwindling wetlands? Yeah, I think generally speaking, they're hugely, uh, they're a huge threat. Um, partly because their spread is so fast. And, and, and I think Sandy, Sandy spoke to this point, like what happens with invasive Phragmites is that they grow in what, what are called stands, which are like these groves. And in, um, in a native environment, the stands are like, they're not as densely packed. So we actually have a species of Phragmites that is native to North America called Phragmites americanus, um, but they're much smaller. They have natural, um, they have other organisms that compete with them and that mm. keep them kind of in check. But here, um, Phragmites australis doesn't. So a stand which can grow up to 15 or 16 feet tall, um, which is how I've modeled the height of this actual piece. I've modeled the tip of the peak to be the height of one, the tip of one Phragmites plant. So that gives you a sense of like the sheer scale of them. Mm -hmm. But one square foot could have up to 200 or one square meter could have up to 200 stands within it. So 200 plants read stalks within a square meter is incredibly dense. So nothing can really grow. Nothing at the ground level is getting light. The uh, chemicals that are released by the plant into the soil hinder any kind of growth at that level. Um, and so it's not hospitable to birds like amphibians. It's basically like wherever they grow, um, they just squeeze everything else out. So if you think about it in that context, they're an enormous threat. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, there are seeds are dispersed in roadways so easily by trucks that pick up these fragments of seeds and rhizomes, which are the roots, and just kind of fling them along the highway. That's why you see them everywhere. Um, my last drive to Montreal was just Phragmites from Montreal to Toronto, just like a constant wall of them, which is sort of interesting because the word Phragmites in Greek means fence. And so there's sort of, again, that sort of semiotic association with like barriers and borders and things like that. Yeah, another thing to note is how easily they spread. I remember when we were harvesting, um, there's a small road that kind of cuts through the space in which we were working. And on one side, all of the Phragmite was, was growing. And on the other side, it was okay, it was clear. And we were advised to be very careful about where the top, the, there's little seeds at the very top of the plant. And we had to be really careful about that falling onto the road because if that if the wind blows it just across the road to the other side, that whole area would have grown the Phragmite really quickly. So it is incredible how easily it can take over. And to that point, like when I first thought of this idea and Sandy and I were talking about it, I thought there's no way the conservation authority is going to let me handle this material because like you know, in our project that ends up making the problem worse is like a worst case scenario, right? I, I always have a fear that something I'm going to do is actually going to make the ecosystem worse off. Um, but was interesting to see the level of enthusiasm. So we worked with Margaret Carney, who is from Thixon's Woods Land Trust, and as I said, Diana Sherman from Cloca, and they had identified a space for us right away because that area was so so covered in this plant and that other area just across that narrow little road was so vulnerable that really like any focus of attention whether that be on the actual harvest or even just drawing public attention to it was it seemed to be appreciated um, and so we did have to be very careful um, there is for those of you at home who have this on your property you have to be very very careful not to to pick the, the, the stands and, and walk around with them because the seeds will just fly everywhere. Um, and you know, to my knowledge, the way to disperse or destroy the bodies is to bag them and then like they have to be burned. So it's, a, it's like a whole like, very extensive, it's like trying to kill a vampire or something, you know? <laughs> but you have to just kill it in six different ways in order to <laughs> stop it from spreading. So there was like, there was quite a pressure actually in the process of the project to not make the situation worse. Um, and that in itself is a real, like there's a learning, there's learning there too. 
Oh, and I did want to say before, I, I didn't mention um, my, my co-faculty at Humber's name, um, but uh, Lynn Short is the professor who um, studies Indigenous knowledge and has incorporated Indigenous um, horticultural techniques into her practice. So if anybody out there is really interested in the turn to like indigeneity in, in the in environmental action, you should check her out, Lynn Short at Humber College. Thank you so much. Um, so I just want to open up the floor to um, our audience members. Does anybody have a question? Uh, feel free to like unmute yourself or pose it on the chat um, if you want to. Let's see. Anybody? We're feeling a little bit shy tonight. That's okay. Well, I've, I've been teaching now all semester online and I know that it usually takes a couple of minutes for people to write things out. So yeah, well, we'll let them, no problem. it's true. It's true. I'm, no, I'm very, but... I'm very eager. <laughs> so, um, I have a question. Oh, please go ahead. All right. So how long um, do these grasses date back in Ontario and um, coal and in your research, uh, we talked about the thatching in England and um, in Ireland, mm -hmm. and it's a very fashionable thing now. And yeah. there are areas where the houses have to be thatched. But initially, it was um, sharecroppers um, thatching the roofs so they had a roof over their head. There was nothing fashionable about it. Um, so I'm wondering if, A, how far back do the grasses grow? And were they used um, with the, either with the indigenous people, because often they move from region to region during the seasons, were they used? Um, or were, did the early settlers use the grasses so that they moved around? Really, the, mm -hmm. that's the final question. Were they moved? Um, is it only Ontario where you find them? or are they right across the, um, the country? That's, those are great questions because um, when I was first researching, I wondered whether or not the, like thatching was even really a practice here. And it really wasn't to, and, you know, I'm sure that there were um, traditions that are unknown to me. So much of our indigenous history has been lost. Um, and so I, I, I would hesitate to say that thatching didn't exist before um, the col you know, colonization. But um, these organisms have, they don't really know exactly when they came, but they do believe that it happened sometime in the 1800s, maybe even the late 1700s. And they really don't know the, the singular reason. There was even a, a report I was reading about the possibility of some of this material um, being carried over oceans by storms, right? So like, mm -hmm. we believe that the spread of this organism is, well, we know that the spread of the organism, the rapid spread of it has a lot to do with human development, but we don't really know exactly what the, the sort of first contact is. Um, we know that the Great Lakes region is particularly susceptible and that's likely because of the way that, that that tract of land was developed. So one of the research papers that I read about it that said, you know, the reason why Phragmites are doing so well here is that when we develop land and highway systems and, and, sh and we ship materials down the seaway, the St. Lawrence Seaway from the ocean, we're not doing so with the knowledge of how sensitive the biodiversity of that, that area actually is. And so instead of thinking about the environment, when we design you know, our infrastructure, we've just kind of gone to design infrastructure that benefits us in the most quick, fast and convenient way. The issue with that is that water and land, the proximity of those two things is, is perfect for cultivating this organism. So if you've got a road right next to a waterway where all of this material is being moved, it's just, it, it moves much, much more, much more quickly rather than say like putting our development in land a little bit more. And so there, there isn't really that much research about it, to be honest. Like, it seems like um, once Phragmites have been identified as the, the, the level of threat that they are now, there's certainly much more research emerging now. Um, but yeah, this particular species, it's pretty new to North America. And we do see it beyond Canada as well. We see it down into the United States. Um, I think the last report I read had three or is the Great Lakes being one of the major ones um, that are most hard hit. Two of the other ones are in, in the United States. 
Yeah, these in, um, invasive plants like Japanese knotweed and purple strife, mm. you know, they're just, they're going everywhere and pushing out so many of the um, native species. Um, I think it's only within the past, I don't know, maybe 50 years or more that we've come to realize just how disastrous they are for the environment. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with Phragmites, like, it was very localized. And so the whole nation of, say, Canada wasn't really concerned because so much of Canada wasn't exposed to it. But, you know, very recently, I've been reading news articles about Phragmites popping up in Western provinces. And that is interesting, because now, you know, we're seeing the organism make its way across such a huge tract of land. It's, you can't just blame it on the water anymore. It's like it has to do with human movement and development. So as long as we continue to do what we're doing at the pace we're doing it in the way we're doing it, um, we will continue to see the situation worsen. And actually, in Lynn Short's essay, she, she said, you know, there is no singular solution for this for this it has to be sort of dealt with at the local level as well. Like everybody affected, every area affected needs to be treated very specifically because each ecosystem is different. And the Phragmites are meeting the challenge of each ecosystem, but you can't necessarily deal with this organism the same way everywhere because the impacts of that management plan may actually further threaten those individual ecosystems. So that complicates it a bit more. You know, you have to mobilize communication between regions, but you have to deal with the situation locally. Um, and I know in my other work with cormorants, where you know we're in this, I won't get into it because I could talk about that forever. But <laughs> government is implementing this cormorant hunt right now across all of Ontario, and it's ill-informed. It's not research-based, mm -hmm. and this kind of strategy of implementing a managed so-called management plan across a huge space like the entire province of Ontario is absolutely contrary to science. So. Mm -hmm. It, it demands more rigor in terms of research. And unfortunately, there just aren't the resources put into this field. Like governments also don't want to fund them, I speculate, because then the gaze turns back toward them and their development plans. And, and I think our particular conservative government right now in Ontario has been very, very negligent when it comes to yeah. conservation, uh, issues of conservation and environmentalism. You think. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Ontario Arts Council, for the thank grant. You. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Paul. That was wonderful. Is there, does anybody else um, have any questions? Oh, you do, Dion. Okay, go for it. Um, I'm just, I don't have a question uh, per se, but I did, there was a question um, from an audience member asking if the piece is still on view or if this is just being done in um, virtually. And I would like to encourage everyone to come down to the VAC, come down to the, to the gallery and have a look at this in person. It's something that wasn't really addressed in Cole's talk because there is so much to discuss, but it is a fully immersive experience that you just can't get the justification of the experience of this folly and this, this amazing artwork on the screen. Um, so we are, the, the piece will be up until February 7th, 2021. So there is lots of time and it would be an amazing opportunity for you to pick up the tangible uh, catalog as well. You can have a view, we have one on display. If it's something you'd like to purchase, they're $10. Um, there is a digital copy fully accessible um, that you can access through screen reader if need be. Um, you want to think about it, then we can mail you one after the fact for um, for the uh, $15 flat fee. So just something to think about. The foot traffic has been, um, you know, surprisingly, there's been visitors to the gallery, <laughs> but it is slower than a normal uh, than than normal. So it is almost how, like having a private viewing experience with the piece. You can spend some time, linger in the space with it, and really contemplate. So I would encourage everyone to come down if you have the opportunity to do so, um, there is plenty of time. So just to address that question, but also you know, encourage everyone else to come and really see it. It's a fully, you can smell it, you can hear it. Um, it's not just something that, you know, I mean, it's amazing we can do this this evening um, to provide this, but really you do need to kind of touch the work. So 
come down and I encourage you all. That's my And point. I would like to second that. The piece <laughs> is extraordinary and you have to step inside it. That's true. You can actually go inside of it, which is something that I didn't know until I spoke to Cole. I'm like, wow, you can actually, you know, it's, you belong in there. You can, you know, contemplate, reflect on anything or, yeah. So it's, it's, it's fantastic in that sense. Uh, I love immersive installations, but that's uh, my own biased uh, perception. <laughs> well, it's like, for me, it's also the space itself. So yeah. there are very few places in Canada where an artist has an opportunity to intervene or to work with um, an air, a space that has so much history and materiality. Um, when Sandy showed me it, she was like, would you consider? And I was like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> because, because it's a very, very rare opportunity to, to create something in response to such an incredible space. And it's one of the few places, as I said, that has retained its, its, its form the way that the VAC has. And I think, you know, I've worked with a lot of regional galleries and I've worked in regional galleries and I know that sometimes it's a challenge to imagine getting out of the city, but now's a good time for it, right? Because there's nothing to do in the city because everybody's in lockdown. So if you want um, a really beautiful day out, I would say visit the, visit the building if you've never been here before. And as Sandy pointed out at the beginning of today's talk, like walk the creek path, it's like beautiful. And maybe even stop in Thixon's Woods on the way back because um, Thixon's Woods is in itself um, just a gem of a place. It's, you know, it's not just a patch of Phragmites. It actually has a forest. It's got a meadow. It has, um, it does have a biodiverse area of marsh. The birds will land on your hands if you put bird seed in them. Like oh, wow. it's a really remarkable, it's a really remarkable place. So there's quite a bit to see. You could certainly make a wonderful day out of it. And for those that live in Toronto, like I do, you can take the GO train and you can get a bus that um, just have to check your schedules that can leave you within a 10 minute walking distance of the gallery. So it's, a, it's not all that difficult to get there if you don't have one of those four, five or four wheel things called a car. <laughs> <laughs> and it's better for hindering the spread of Phragmites if you take That's public true. transit. That's true. <laughs> We actually have uh, one more question. Um, so this is from Diana Shermit uh, Williamson. So she said, I went last week and it was beautiful. Great job, Cole. How long did it take to make? Wow, to actually physically build it. Um, that's a tough one. Sandy, I know, when did we start storing? We started storing it. We started thatching in October. Yeah. Uh, we stored it, I think for a couple of months yeah then we transported it to the gallery um, and we we let it dry for those two months so we had to store it let it dry transport it to the gallery and before we could install it we had to build the structure and that was if if you could see behind this and i've got like a screen here so there's there's a lot of um kind of architectural things we had to get around in the loft gallery and measure the, the folly fits perfectly, perfectly within the space. So there was a, a lot of back and forth in figuring out how to build the structure first and then the process of thatching. So to the whole thing took months and months to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, it was a constant process. And while one thing was happening, there are other things happening in the works. Um, so a nod to Elliot Callahan, he's a good friend of mine and a builder who helped me design the structure and actually build the framework. Um, and then to try to predict how thick the reed would actually be on the structure was, was taken into consideration. So my proudest art moment in this from a structural perspective is that the beam that you see right here behind my finger, like the, the angle of the pyramid clears the beam by about a half of an inch. So it's so tight into the space, which is exactly what I wanted. I wanted it to look like if the pyramid got any bigger, it would actually compromise the architecture if it burst through, you know, the beams. Um, a nod to that idea of like the, the, uh, the pressure, the sort of almost imminent, uh, imminent danger to the environment around it. So, um, and then Harry and I, um, Harry Knight and I thatched the process over a couple weeks so it was it was months of work. Um, 
and it's you know it's it, like it's an it's a really interesting thing to to as an artist to to work on forms like this because you know you're not really doing it for a, a, a big paycheck i'm not going to sell this thing um but the benefit of it um and i'm not i'm not saying i wasn't like supported by the gallery and also by the arts councils and all this stuff i was um, but the benefit of it is certainly not commercial it, it's more like to benefit the public the community the sort of environmental um, to draw greater awareness to the environmental workers um, like Diana, who asked that question. I'm so excited that you're here with us today, Diana. Um, and so, you know, it's about labor, it's about activism and volunteerism. And I'm reminded of a, of a quote, which I'm going to paraphrase now by Isabel Stangers, who is talking with the series of uh, theorists and curators about ecological collapse and art. And she says that, you know, the destruction happens passively. Like this, things get destroyed without an awareness of that. But to repair, to, to reverse that takes actual tangible action. And it needs to be something that's intentional and it needs to be based on education and it needs to be something that oh. I think we lost Cole for a second. Yeah. We have lost Cole. I'll just take this opportunity to just inform everybody there was a beautiful film produced as well. Um, one of the things that we considered was accessibility because this was built in the loft space, but we do not have an elevator. So accessibility was an issue and very important to Cool um, that there was a film produced um, alongside the folly that documents the harvesting, the building process um, and what really went into the project. So again, if you do come down, we're open Tuesday to Sunday, 10 to four. Uh, 10 to 1230 is for, reserved for seniors and immunocompromised people. So if that is a worry right now, we do have sp space allocated for those visitors specifically. And then uh, the 1230 till four is open to the general public. There's a space that you can sit, watch and experience the film and then meander up to, to go in, and see the folly. Um, it looks like we have lost Cole. I'm not sure if there's a way to get him back online. Um, Oh, I, I think um, I just wanted to note to add to his point that he mm -hmm. education was such a big part of this process and um, it wasn't the process of educating our participants and the people who helped build and create and harvest the Phragmite. Uh, it was a very um, active and engaged process in which people, the people who come to, the people who came out to harvest the work were co-creators in the work, but also those who come to visit, um, you really, it is an immersive experience. You have to crouch down, even though the, the folly feels monumental and so incredibly large and it does take over the whole loft gallery. You have, you physically have to crouch down to get into that doorway, to get into the folly. And then you're surrounded by the thatched um, Phragmite and you have a sound um, installation in that space. So even you visiting kind of, um, you become, you, you have this embodied knowledge that uh, you process as you experience the work because it really requires you to actively engage and get in there and experience it. So um, that that is part of the education. I, I mean, before working with Cole, I did not know what Phragmite was to, to confess, but now I see it everywhere. <laughs> and um, I, that's part of the project. So, oh, he's back. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> We held down the folly for you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're muted. There you go. Am, am I good? Yeah. I think I was talking too long. The, the <laughs> universe was telling me to stop talking. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, uh, both uh, to you and, um, and Sandy for this like wonderful talk, it was so thorough. Um, there were so many ideas that were floating around and I just wanna highlight it back to the, to the catalog. Um, so this is actually available to purchase at the VAC for $10 as Dion mentioned, but also online for 15 and we're happy to send it home to you. Um, there's, I believe a digital uh, version also available as, as Dion mentioned. Um, so we're grateful to both you, uh, Cole and Sandy for the talk, obviously to our audience members who joined us from like all across the country, the province, it's amazing, are contributing essays to our here 
here. Helen and Daryl, I see that you're you're on as well. Um, so yeah, thank you for celebrating this, this catalog launch, this exhibition, this uh, wonderful uh, process of creating art and working with the community and so many partners as well. So yeah, thank you all and have a wonderful night and hopefully we'll, you'll come and visit us soon. Thank you, Noor. Thank you. And Noor. thank you all. Thank you. Bye everyone.